Very happy to be here, thank you. <laughs> and it's an honour. Someone asked, someone contacted me this morning and said, look, the, the audience is down to 25. You don't have to come up. I said, well, that's that. No, no, I'm coming up. It doesn't matter. You should have this as a rule for yourself, especially if you are a teacher or a presenter. It doesn't matter how many people are in the audience. Right? You, you're here to do work for God and, um, and little things count. Uh, and I guarantee you 20, 30, 50, 100 in the context of the universal church, it's small, but all these little things count very importantly. And um, I, I think in 1997 was my record low audience. I had a, an audience of only one person and I went ahead and did the presentation because you just feel obliged and you should do that irrespective of the numbers. Don't worry about the numbers, uh, the numbers are good. Okay. Thanks, Robert. So you can keep posting questions and I'll keep popping up here. We're going to start with, and you can also like questions and um, they'll get brought up to the top of our list here. So the first question at the top of the list currently with the most likes, when does gossip become gossip? People most often confuse gossip as venting. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a good question and gossip afflicts everyone. I think I'm guilty of it too. I work in a workplace where there's a lot of gossip and I do have a conscience and I do get worried about it. There, I think it's not gossip if what you're saying has to be said to the right people. Like if I've got an issue at work and I'm venting to my boss about it or to someone in authority who has a right to hear it or a, who needs to know what's being said, it's not gossip. Now last night by coincidence, I'm. <clears throat> I finished my work and I just joined my wife downstairs to watch a show on Netflix and this show, the new show my wife is watching, she dictates what we watch, <laughs> uh, is this show called Dubai Bling. I don't know if any of you know of it, but these are obscenely rich women living in Dubai and they're you know, they're different types of Arabs. They come from Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or Lebanon or Egypt or whatever. And they're all extremely attractive and extremely wealthy. And all they do the whole show is gossip. And they say that. They admit that they're just gossiping. And what it is, they're just complaining about each other, complaining about this person's faults, this person that, this person said this, this person did that, this person wears that. And that, that's, that's gossip. When you're putting someone down, Right, simply because of maybe envy or jealousy, or you know, you want to you want to see someone you know uh, be hurt, wounded, or whatever. But if if the conversation relates to issues that are important, and you're talking to someone who needs to know, or someone who can help with the situation, it's not gossip. That's that's one distinction I would make. All right. Okay, next question. Why shouldn't we actively parish off? Why shouldn't we? Well, what's normative is that you should belong to one parish. Okay, that's normal. That's how the church really wants us to worship. By the way, the idea of parish or diocese, uh, in my view, comes uh, in found, found remotely in Scripture, in the feeding of the 5,000 by Christ when he miraculously multiplied the loaves and the fishes. And why do I say that? Because Jesus had the disciples divide everyone up into groups of 50 and 100. That's, that's what they did. And in my mind, imagine the 5,000 represent the church overall, the people of God overall. But to manage them, uh, to organize them, because we're human beings and we need management, we need organization, we need structure. But they are divided into groups of 50 and 100. So small parishes, larger parishes. That's how I image it. So for the sake of organisation, you know, uh, the church has always had dioceses and within those dioceses parishes and we're in a geographical border and we belong to a parish and we should go to that parish. That's normative. Why people parish hop is because sometimes, as human beings, we're more attracted to priest Y over priest X. We might think that priest Y is 
more holy or more intelligent and has better homilies and I get more nourishment spiritually there than I would get at the other parish, which is my normal parish. It's an unfortunate situation, but it's understandable from a human perspective. Um, and there's a lot of that that goes around. Some people think, oh, that priest is too conservative, too right-wing, and so I'm going to go over to that more, you know, liberal or, you know, relaxed priest, and vice versa. And I know of that happening all the time in, for example, Roman Catholic parishes. I think from our perspective as Maronites, it's an issue because, you know, if we're going to church hop, and I do this, I'm, I'm guilty of this, so I'm not going to pretend I, I, I'm, I'm perfect here, but, you know, we... We, we have so many Maronites are in Roman parishes, okay? And there are some Romans who actually like to come to Maronite parishes. At the moment, when I go to Mass in the morning at St. Charles, um, there's two people there who are not Maronite. One old Roman person at the back, his name is Cole, and another Asian person on my left. Now, they're not born Maronite, but they're coming to Maronite Masses. And they probably have good reasons for that, maybe. They appreciate the deeper Maronite spirituality in the liturgy, or it's just a convenient mass to go to, like by way of timing, etc. I say this as a general rule. There's only one baptism. Okay, there's no Roman baptism, Maronite baptism, or Melkite baptism, or Orthodox baptism. There's one baptism. We're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that makes us, it doesn't make us Maronite, Melkite, Orthodox, Roman. It makes us Christian. It makes us a member of Christ. And through that, a member of the church. What makes, what made me Maronite was that by the law of the church, the canon law of the church, I was baptized at St. Felix Bankstown. 9th of August 1964, how do I know that? Because I had to get my baptism certificate when I was confirmed at the age of 22. <laughs> and, um, that, and I thought, oh, someone said, well, then you're not Maronite, you're Roman, you're Roman Catholic. And I panicked when I was told that. How old was I at the time? I was about 25 when I was told that. And I did an investigation, I rang the, uh, the diocesan office, the Maronite diocesan office, and the priest there at the time said, no, no, no. The law of the truth is that you follow the right of your father. So my father was Maronite. When I got baptised, even at St Felix, I didn't become Roman. I was, became Maronite. But I'm Christian, Catholic, Maronite. And I, we should retain our Maroniteness. I remember Bishop Ard Abicada used to use that term a lot. Maroniteness. All right? I don't like people who go to extremes. I don't like people who are... Maronite who just want to be in the Roman Rite and even to go to the Latin Mass at Lewisham and they despise their Maronite heritage. I don't like that extremism. And I don't like the other extremism of people who are, who are Maronite and just and to say you only can go to Maronite parishes. This is me personally. But the reality is, is that, I mean, when I was born in, the, in 1964, there wasn't Maronite parishes where I lived. So as I was in my very young years, my parents were taking me to St. Felix. Then it was mostly St. Jerome's Punch Bowl. It was St. St. John Vianney Greenacre. And when they started St. Charles in 1973, which is virtually across the road from where we lived, because we lived in that shop on the corner, which is now Lepiculo's. My dad built that in 1968. Yeah. So when we, we lived there, and when my mum said, oh, we're not going to, we're going to go to the new Maronite church now across the road, which was an altar in the lounge room in a house in 1973, I said, fantastic, because I found the Roman Catholic Church masses boring. <laughs> and then when I got started in the Maronite masses there in that lounge room in 1973, I, not only as a nine-year-old, found it not only boring, but I couldn't understand it either. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so, right, but, you know, you, you should predominantly worship as Maron. And you can go from time to time to, you know, parish hopping to a Roman church here, a Roman church here, whatever, that's okay. But don't abandon your Maronite base, your Maronite roots. All right? That's, I think, is essential. Which, it's great to be Maronite, we should be proud of that, in a humble way, proud of that. I hope that's not contradictory, all right? Uh, but, but in the end, we are all followers of Christ, all Christian, all Catholic, okay? And so sometimes we can pierce through that, those, those 
you know, ecclesial barriers, and that's all right, okay? What can you do to bring your family members closer to the church and practice the faith? Yeah, that's hard. I think I'm going through a little bit of that now. What can we do is firstly be faithful ourselves and be authentic. The way people get turned off religion, especially young people who are cynical, critical, is when they see hypocrisy. So if I've got a family member who's not practicing the faith as they ought to, well, I've got to show it in front of them. And I, and I have to be patient and I have to be loving and I can't criticise someone or attack someone into a better practice of the faith. It doesn't work. I know from experience. I know from my younger brother, for example, he, he always resisted me. Now, my younger brother is great in the faith, thanks God, and he runs the RCIA there in the parish of St. Charles. And he came to a better, regular, authentic practice of his faith, not through me, an older brother trying to impose it on him, but from someone else who challenged his faith, and then he got all riled up and decided to research it. And he came to the faith through that avenue. But, I mean, I had this discussion yesterday with a particular priest, and the advice that he imparted to me, which I pass on to you now, is that just be gently steadfast in your faith, be authentic, be patient, be loving, and people mature, young people mature, and they will gravitate to authenticity, okay? And God will do the rest. God will work on them. Um, and it's always good to introduce third parties. When I had my children much younger, I made sure that they got exposed to the Catholic faith to other people, not just their parents. So they went to Fetter Sand at St. Charles. They had a tutor come into the house who was a mo who modelled the faith for them. And, and he would repeat and say things that I would say. And, you know, you tend to not be a prophet in your own home, so your kids will listen to someone else. And it, it generally it works. How can you help a friend who's turned away from the church due to same-sex relationship desires? Okay. This is a, 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 probably the most common type of question young people ask today, and I'm happy to have it here in this forum and answer it. You never, I would say firstly, keep them as a friend. Same-sex desire is something innate in the person. It is an objective disorder, and I've just said something that'll get me in big trouble out there in, in the broader world. But it is an objective disorder, but you know, every human being has objective disorders in their <laughs> sexual appetite, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. So we are all wounded by regional sin in our sexual appetite in one way or another. Keep that person as a friend, and but at the same time, gently and, and lovingly, let them know that this particular attraction they have is not sinful in itself, but it is a disorder. It's not a proper, a, something innate in that person. It's a spiritual psych, psycho-spiritual disorder. I don't know if you can say that to them, but I'm talking to you objectively. It's a psycho-spiritual disorder. <laughs> and you have to, in that context of friendship, let them know that what's best for you, my friend, uh, is that you rely on God's grace to practice chastity. I'm still your friend. Hey, I taught students who are same-sex attracted. I have a relative who's same-sex attracted, right? And I work in a workplace where there are same-sex attracted people, but also who live the lifestyle. Now, I can never approve the lifestyle. Like if my friends or people I knew were you know, heterosexually active in the wrong way, you know, uh, living in a de facto relationship, womanising, going from one woman to another, or committing adultery. I mean, they're, they're heterosexual disorders. Okay? I, if I had someone I knew who I loved as a friend engaging in heterosexual disorder behaviour, well, I would still love them as a human being. I'd still be their friend as much as possible. But I'd have to say, listen, what you're doing is wrong. 
It's not God's plan for you. It's not the right way you should live. It's not the way for happiness and it's not the way to heaven, right? But you can't, don't fall into the trap, the easy trap of name calling um, and, and anger and just, you know, uh, end up hating each other because that's not going to help anybody, right? But don't fall into the other trap of saying, hey, your lifestyle is okay. I've got no problem with it. Keep going because I don't think that's, that's not evangelization. That's, that's not passing on the good news, right? <clears throat> just as a follow-up to that, because there's a similar question that's come through. In a workplace setting, um, does that change at all in terms of how you can act towards them and, and love them? Well, in a workplace setting, if, if I'm working with someone who's same-sex attracted or in a same-sex relationship, same-sex active, well, I will do my job and they need to do their job. And so our, our professional relationship shouldn't be affected by how we're living our lives morally. Right? And it's like, okay, here's a, a, a superficial funny comparison you know i support this football team i work with someone who supports another football, football team i don't like but that shouldn't affect our working relationship does it no it wouldn't same in this issue though the issue of sexual activity uh, improper sexual activity is a much more serious thing than you know which football team you follow but you need to keep your you need to maintain your professional working standards and not allow yourself to yeah, fall again into the trap of not doing your job properly and not cooperating with other people in the workplace properly because of their, you know, irregular lifestyles. Is it prudent to enter new relationships, date continuously, without breaks? And do you need to have a friendship slash know them to a degree prior to dating? Well, if a person is, uh, what? Well, they're going from uh, their serial girlfriends or boyfriends. So they, they've got a girlfriend, boyfriend, breaks up, they go to another one straight away. Well, look, that's up. I think that's a question of prudence. Some people, they're in a relationship, and it's a good relationship. It's not just physically attracted. They're not just two people who are physically attracted to each other, but they somehow become emotionally intertwined. Right? And that's how it should be. Um, you know, when you're interested in someone, you're not just interested in their body, just one part of them. You're interested in them as a person. So you should be, you know, getting to know each other, uh, you know, culturally, socially, morally, psychologically, you know, getting to really, uh, in, you know, engage at those levels. And the physical comes later once, it's, once you enter into marriage. But some people, when they break up, it's very hard. It's, it's, it's really painful. It's really a heartbreak. And they're not in a position straight away to necessarily go, go and have a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend straight away. And, that's, and I understand that. That's probably what the norm, that's how it should be normally. It's a question, I think it varies from one person to the next. And also about people's own energy levels as well, I imagine. It, you know, being in a relationship is, is a, is a it's, it's hard work sometimes, and, and you know, if someone's going from one relationship to the next that easily, well, let's I'll be a bit wary of that, because um, I don't think it's it's necessarily that that's the case with most people. What was the second part of the question? Of course, you should. In fact, I I was speaking to a young teacher earlier this year in March who got married in June. I know this teacher very well. She's up and coming. She's a real superstar, really. She's only 30 and she's an AP already. And when she got engaged and, we got, and she showed me her ring and we were talking, I said something to her that shocked her and she didn't understand. I said, you know, are you two friends? And she was taken aback by that because for her, you know, she's engaged, she's in love. It's, the romance dominates at the moment. And that's okay, that's normal. Not trying to diminish that or take that away. But what's most important for the long term, you know, the 20, 30, 40, 50 year long term, what's gonna, what's gonna sustain the marriage in the long term is not the romantic feeling, good feeling in the stomach. That's there, that's part of it. But that's the icing on the cake. If that, have, 
hopefully that lasts a long time and the longer the better but it's not going to last forever what's the most important is that you are friends really i know that from my own experience i've, I've been married enough long enough now i'm married now 23 years and i'm not an expert if my wife was here listening to me speaking now she would have to con control her love but um, <laughs> and that's okay because we're all human beings we all make mistakes but friendship absolutely you, you don't start as friends but you have to develop a friendship okay you know i mean as human beings with, with bodies we are what predominates is the physical attraction at first but that's like someone when you're going to buy a house and when you arrive at the house what do you see first we see the front of the house oh that looks nice wow i want that house but really before you buy that house you should go inside that house and you should look at every other aspect of the house, every other room, the backyard, everything else, before you say, okay, let's make an offer. Let's propose, right? And so we got it. Okay, the initial physical attraction is important. That's the attraction. But then, you know, we've got to go in, in, you know, in, investigate the whole person, search out the whole house and become friends and um, and that can turn in, of course, develop into love and the, and the romance and the emotion, which is all good. But still at the core of that is a friendship. Because, you know, for the most of your marriage, you're not going to actually feel love. It's not going to be a feeling. It's something in the will. I had this debate with my wife many years ago. And I, I still believe I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, because love is in the will. You, you're, you're in love, you don't necessarily feel it when you're long term in marriage. You're not feeling, oh, I'm in love. Oh, you don't feel that way, but you have to will it. It's in the will. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Why isn't smoking a sin if it is harmful? And I think for completion, um, if we could include vaping and other gear yeah, in there as well. Yeah, well, what was, the, what was the second one? Between smoking and other Oh, vaping, it's the yeah. electronic cigarette. Look, it's, there's a simple rule here. Um, if you know what you're doing is damaging your body, then you should stop. It doesn't matter if it's smoking, vaping, or adagili. Now, I attended a seminar once about adagili, the dangers of smoking adagili. I was shocked at how bad it was. I couldn't believe it. Because my mother-in-law and my wife and, and all my brothers, all that side of the family, they just love it. Even I've smoked out of India. I can count the number of times in my life that I've smoked, and it's only about seven or eight times. All right? First time was when I was seven and I stole my father's packet of Marlboro, right? And I was smoking it in a, somewhere hiding. I was thinking, why do they do this? It just tastes awful, you know? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's the general rule. Now, to say, okay, if you smoke, it's a sin, no. I'd believe if you use that, it's a sin, no. If you vape, it's a sin, no. But, you know, different people have different tolerance levels when it comes to their body and health. You shouldn't be smoking, drinking, eating, consuming anything uh, when you know it's beginning to damage your health. Now, the same... You know, your body is a gift from God. It's meant to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're meant to look after it. And we, when you say in the creed, we believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, you're not going to be in heaven just in your soul. It's going to be your body, your glorified body, united with your soul, like Christ rose from the body, in, in the body. And that might be a hard rule for certain people. But when you know you're doing something that's damaging your health, and could short curtail your life, your life spent, you should stop. How do we discern the best way to use our money? Investing, gambling, risk taking, at what point does it become imprudent? Um, well, you're asking someone who's very conservative with his money. I'm not a, I'm not a risk taker. I'm surrounded by people who invest in gold and silver. It's gone nowhere in years. Crypto just goes up and down. It's share market, 
real estate. This is more financial advice than spiritual advice. Um, and people have different risk appetites. I'm conservative in the sense that I work, I save my money. I have a good superannuation scheme. Catholic super is very good. And I've only, and my biggest investments over the years have been real estate, property. Okay. And most of my properties have been good. There's a one or two duds, but most of them are good. Um, I'm, I wouldn't advise people to go into those fringe investments. If you want to invest in shares, you look for the shares that pay for the good dividends, not, the sh not going into shares expecting the big capital gains. That's more gambling. I don't, would never promote anyone to gamble. I don't, I don't have a problem with a bit of a you know, f bet or here or there on a football game or the Melbourne Cup coming up this week. But I've seen on both sides of my family, my father and mother's side, uncles completely destroyed by gambling. One of my uncles would have been a millionaire dozens of times over being a builder in the building industry, but because of his gambling habit, reduced himself going to prison twice in the Northern Territory, then in Long Bay Jail, because his gambling habits led to criminal activity, led to him being in prison uh, and virtually destroying his life and his family's life, etc. So I wouldn't advise anyone to gamble. I don't, I think people want to buy shares, look for the ones that are blue chip, are solid, that pay good dividends, avoid these modern crazy types of you know hyper fluctuating investments like crypto gold and silver i don't know what that, that does really it doesn't pay shares it, it doesn't pay dividends it hasn't gone up anywhere in 10 years i know i bought silver my friends were impressing upon buy silver buy silver buy silver so i bought silver you know 14 years ago and i sold it a few years later made a hundred dollars and since then it's only gone backwards you know, silver is less now than what I sold it in 2012. Okay, so, you know, be hard working, be prudent with your money, save it, have a good superannuation program, buy real estate. Uh, in, 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 in Sydney, New South Wales, it always doubles every 10 years, as long as you don't buy somewhere in swampland or something like that. Right. Okay, coming back to spiritual currency. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's more important. Is there a Bible verse that mentions purgatory? Yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. That's the most important one. There are about half a dozen other verses that can be used materially to support belief in purgatory. The term purgatory is not in Scripture, but that doesn't matter. The doctrine's there materially. The word trinity is not there either. Hypostatic union is not there either. Transubstantiation is not there either. These are ecclesiastical terms to understand something which materially can be found in Scripture. So St. Paul talks about judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. He's talking about how he laid the foundation of the church in Corinth, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And there'll be others who come after him who will build on that foundation. And St. Paul says that those who come after him will build in different ways, some in gold, silver, there's gold and silver again, <laughs> precious stones, right? And these are people who do a really good job. But there are others who will come who will build in wood and straw. So they're going to be people who are going to not do a great job. But he's not condemning them. He said, and, and when, we are, when we're judged, we're going to be, on the day of judgment, we're going to pass, all our work is going to be tested on the day of judgment. And for those who didn't do such a good job, they're going to be tested by fire. Their work is going to be tested by fire. And they're going to, and the person themselves who has not worked as well as they should have, will be, will suffer loss, but yet they'll be saved as one who passes through fire. So what type of, so Paul's not saying, so Paul's not saying they're going to go to hell for eternity. Okay. They've been good, they've been workers in the vineyard. They're believers in Jesus Christ, but maybe they were lazy or sloppy or a bit mediocre, and the job they did was not as great as it could have been. So their work will be burned up, but they themselves will be saved. They'll suffer loss, but yet they'll still be saved as one who passes through fire. So how do you suffer loss but still be saved? 
So it's not hell, because if, if it's hell, it's eternal. Your loss is forever, and you can't be saved. Now, you're not going to suffer, you know, loss in heaven. So it's what, the St. Paul's not talking about hell, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about someone who will suffer loss, that is temporarily, but they'll still be saved. So temporary loss, they'll pass through fire. Well, what's that? It's a temple punishment. It's what we call purgatory. And purgatory has two purposes. It is where you complete your incompleted temple punishment for sins that have been forgiven, but it's also a place of purification, final perfection. So one way, you can, you can spin purgatory in two ways. The negative, that is a place of temple punishment, and the positive, that is a place of purification and perfection. Because heaven is, is the wedding feast. It's Re Revelation 19 talks about the, re the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the Lamb is Jesus Christ. And the wedding is the, between Christ and his church. And the, and the church is his bride. And the bride is done up beautifully for the husband, for the groom. And we are members of the bride. And we're going to be perfected and made beautiful for the groom. And where is that? Where, where is the beauty parlour? Okay. Purgatory is God's beauty parlour to perfect us to, for heaven. Again, another verse in the book of Revelation, nothing imperfect can enter into heaven. So we are perfected, beautified in purgatory for the wedding. Like any woman getting married, what happens in the first part of the day? They're spending hours becoming beautiful. Sometimes it's a bit overdone, but anyway, okay? And that's just, that is the image, and that's what purgatory is in a sense, okay? Both place of temple punishment and pur purification, perfection. It's good news if you're in purgatory, because you're going to end up in heaven. Fantastic. Okay? Yeah. The apostolic succession is key to our faith, but why aren't there only 12 bishops like there originally was? Because the church has grown. There's no, Christ chose 12 as an image of the restoration of ancient Israel. So originally there were the 12 tribes of Israel and only one of them was the Jews. And they went through all that trauma from the time of Jacob, who became Israel, so it's about 19th century BC, that's nearly 2,000 years before the coming of Christ. And by the time Christ comes into the world, the Israelites are really a remnant people. We're calling them now the Jews. But the Jews are the people who belong to one tribe only, Judah. So there were many other tribes. With, you know, The ten tribes in the north were destroyed in, by the Assyrians in 722 BC. But there were still remnants of Israelites of those 12 tribes that were not taken away. And then the Babylonians destroyed Judah in 587 BC. So by the time we had Jesus and Mary, the Jews were a remnant of the Israelites. And of course, the perfect, the, 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 and who were the perfect models of, of those remnant Israelites were Jesus and Mary. Jesus chose 12 disciples as a sign of restoring not just the old Israel, but building the new Israel, the universal Israel. So Jesus comes into the world through a Jewess for the Jews and through the Jews for everyone else. So the new Israel is, constitutes those Jews who will accept Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah and the rest of the world, the Gentiles, who likewise will accept Jesus as the Messiah. But, okay, he starts with 12, then Judas drops out, goes to 11. He's replaced by Matthias. But straight away we're seeing in the ancient church that St. Peter and St. is ordaining people. I mean, here's, what, here's the line of apostolic succession. So St. Peter is ordaining Paul and Barnabas. And Paul ordains Titus for Crete, Timothy, so how many generations do we see there? God the Father sends Jesus, Jesus sends the 12 apostles. One of them is Peter who sends, who ordains, he ordains Paul and Barnabas and, and Paul is ordaining, we know Titus and, and Timothy. So we're seeing it there already. And as the church grows, it's, you know, it's going to need more than 12 men to run it. And we see that in the Acts of the Apostles already happening. I mean, 
the apostle begin to complain you know there's there's a tension between the jewish believers and the greek believers okay and the apostles are saying well we don't have time to serve you know to wait on tables we have to preach the gospel so they ordain deacons so we see there the church is expanding okay the, the apostolic succession these are this is ordination of deacons and then we have presbyters i mean jesus didn't create deacons and presbyters he sent forth the apostles who had the, the they had the plenary power of the priesthood and then the church in its wisdom guided by the holy spirit then would create other ministries presbyter and deacon to serve the growing church and when you got the church coming out of Jerusalem and going to Antioch and Alexandria and then later eastwards to Persia and India and throughout Asia Minor, then Greece and Rome and Gaul and, and Spain and North Africa, around you know, Egypt and, and Cyrene, that's Libya, and Carthage, right, right across. You've got to have more than 12 men running the local churches. So we know, you know, there are already hundreds and hundreds of bishops in the early church. You know, there's Trying to get the number right exactly how many there were at at, um, at Nicaea. I think it was about 320 okay. at Nicaea, and they were they only represented about 30 percent of the bishops in the world at that time. Okay. It's a practical necessity to have more than 12 bishops in the world. Okay. Apart from acts of asceticism, abstinence, and fasting, which have clear purpose. Would God, a loving Father, want us to see suffering similar to what St. Rafka did? St. Rafka is a special, what we call the vessel of election. It, you know, we admire St. Rafka, but you know, she, for, she's called to that specifically by Christ. It's very imprudent to say that. It's, it's, it's com completely wrong to say that we should all have the same spirituality and practices as St. Rafka because she is specifically called to be that. Now, it's different for each person. Of course, each one of us should have some level of asceticism, prayer, fasting, abstinence, because these things are necessary to help get the dominion of, this, of the spirit over the body. Because that's one of the consequences of original sin, concupiscence, wayward desire for pleasure. And we have to get reconstitute the dominion of the spirit over the flesh but for me to say oh i'm going to pray like saint rafka to have the same you know in in to endure the same level of suffering that she did would be more than imprudent more than imprudent for me i'm not necessarily called to that i'm called to a different vocation within the church there's a bottom line, we should all have some level of abstinence and fasting and penance and prayer, absolutely. But we can't, we, we, we can't look at the saints and say, oh, we should be like another one, Simon Stylites, you know, standing on that pillar for 30 years, living on top of that pillar in the Middle East for 30 years. Oh, I should be like him. No, you're not. He was called to that. We admire that, but we got to practice the level of, we've got to practice a spirituality that we have been called to and graced for. Not that, you know, out of pride, try to do more than what we've been gifted to do. People are often obsessed with plenary indulgences, not knowing they require a full detachment from sin to achieve it. Should we tell them to relax? <laughs> relax. <laughs> Don't seek more than once a month. That's a good, prudent rule. A plenary indulgence is a full remission of a temporal punishment due to sin that's been forgiven. It's part of the power of, that the church has to forgive sins. Now, it's the power of the keys. You see, this is what many people don't understand about the church. The church is an extension of Christ, continuing to work in the world to do what Christ was doing. One thing that Christ did was forgive sins. So Christ empowered the church to forgive the sins. It was the first thing he did after he rose from the dead. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you shall hold, they are held fast. 
What an incredible power and authority Christ gave to weak and sinful men. The disciples were weak and sinful men. Not that we're better. We're weak and sinful people as well. But the church also, Christ gave to St. Peter the keys to bind and loose. He also gave, and that's in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, he gave the other disciples the authority to bind and loose. And if the church can forgive sins and therefore remit someone's <laughs> eternal punishment in hell, then if they can do the greater, the church can do the lesser, which is remit temporal punishment due to sin. So an indulgence means kindness. I'll give you an example of indulgence. You owe me a thousand dollars. That's your debt to me. I'll give you an indulgence. If you cut my grass next Saturday, you don't have to pay me a thousand dollars. All right? Okay? Sounds like a good deal. I've been kind to her. I'm asking you, but for you to get this indulgence from me, to remit that debt you owe to me, you have to do that other work. Cut my grass. You cut my grass, you don't have to pay me a thousand dollars anymore. And that's, I've been indulging towards her. That's what the church has the authority to do. You owe this much temporal punishment. We don't know what that is. God knows. We don't, we don't, don't try and measure it. But if you do these other things in this, in, if you do these other things, go to confession, sacramental confession, receive Holy Communion, pray for the intentions of the Pope, do another indulgence act like praying a rosary in the church. If you do those things, and of course you do have to have detachment from all sin, okay? You do have to be renouncing sin, mortal envy, as a general concept, right? Then, you're, then the church, by its power and authority invested in her by Christ, will remit all your temporal punishment and purgatory. And if whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. So Christ will ratify what the church does there. Right. Now, you should be aware of this and practice it from time to time. As I said, but you know, you do it no more than once a month. You've got to keep balance here in your life. But, and you do have to, though, have a renunciation of sin. Absolutely. But as I said, you don't want to get all worked up and tense about it. If you've got any anxiety, you know, any trauma within your mind in, in practice of your faith, something's gone wrong somewhere. And there's something psychologically has gone wrong. And another example of it is scrupulosity. Scrupulosity is a psychological disorder that exaggerates sin and its consequences. And people who go through scrupulosity also have a misconceived view of God. And I speak from experience. And back in 1989, when I was 25, I went through this. I had a terrible bout of scrupulosity. It was so bad, I went to confession five times in six days. And I only got out of it because I followed a rule that someone said to me, bind yourself to a knowledgeable spiritual director and observe everything he tells you, whether you like it or not. And within two weeks, I was cured. Okay. Uh, but if you're unhappy, if you're miserable in your faith, well, something's gone wrong, and it's probably due to your own mispractice or misconception, I was self-regulating at the age of 25. I was building my own spiritual life and doing my own things without reference to a knowledgeable you know, spiritual director, and that's why I got caught up in this. But being miserable in my faith is a sure sign that something's wrong. And also, when you have this distorted view of sin, it's because you have a distorted view of God. You know, my view of God at that time was that was, of course I knew God was loving and forgiving, but what predominated in my mind was the God who was judge and who would condemn. And so I'm worried about sin. So little defects were venial sins for me, and venial sins were mortal sins for me, and mortal sins were unforgivable sins, right? And that was my, one, one aspect of my issue at the time. But God's not an assassin who's waiting for you to sin, and when you've sinned, he'll take you out, 
judge you and send you to hell. That's not what God is like. God is someone who loves you and wills that you go to heaven. Okay? So he's willing, he's on your side, he's cheering us on. Sure, we're going to sin, we're going to fall, we're going to do wrong. But he's not there ready to press that red button like Simon Cowell and send you to hell, you know, because you misperformed. Right? He's going to be wanting you and helping you to get up and do it and repent and do it right again and again and again. What is the difference between spiritual desolation and spiritual dryness? Oh, wow. These are very centuries of avalanche questions. <laughs> okay. Well, well, spiritual dryness is something that would affect a lot of ordinary good Catholics who are, over many years will their spirituality I mean we we have this it's like marriage when you get married you have your honeymoon period and the, you know, the elation and the joy and but then you fall into the routine it's like anything when you start a new job then you fall into the routine when you buy anything new you're excited then you fall into the routine and same with the spiritual life spiritual dryness in my view is when you're doing what you have to do going to daily mass praying the divine office doing doing what you have to do if you're a priest hearing confessions you know saying the mass and, you, and it tends to become a routine you've lost that initial fire and enthusiasm but you're still there you're still doing what you know you have to do you're still performing but there's that just the, the, the fire has gone out a little bit but it's still there it's not raging it's it's lukewarm okay now I'm, I'm probably with spiritual desolation i have to read up again on that you know to get it right according to how the mystics would describe it but i'll give you one take on a spiritual desolation you know the dark night of the soul it's a form of desolation what's the dark night of the soul like what did people like st john of the cross go through and write about i think jesus went through a dark night of the soul when he was on the cross when he said my god my god why have you forsaken me he was quoting psalm 21 to give reference to the scribes and the pharisees in front of him that you're fulfilling the prophecies embedded in that psalm because that's the first line of psalm 21 my god my god why hast thou forsaken but Jesus also felt forsaken. Why? It's not because God abandoned him. But this was to, to perfect his sacrifice. He was going to obey the will of the Father. Even though he felt abandoned by the Father. And that's an expression of perfect love and obedience. He went through that desolation on the cross. And to perfect that sacrifice, he actually felt desolated he felt abandoned but even when he felt that abandonment he still obeyed he still obeyed the will of the father and that made his sacrifice perfect out of perfect love he loved and continued to love and obey even though he had that temptation that feeling that he was abandoned by the father right so if you're in desolation you're in this zone where you feel alone you don't and I think Mother Teresa, Saint Teresa of Calcutta, our modern saint in the 20th century, she said she went through this for 40 years, where no matter what she did or no matter what she prayed, she had no consolation, no joy, but she kept doing it, and she was willing it, and that perfected her spiritual life and everything she did. She, this is what this, I'll finish with this quote from Saint Teresa of Avila, you know. Most people want the consolation of God. The, they don't want the God of consolations. They want the consolations of God. So most people of us, we want God to give us grace to make us feel good. So we want his consolations. But St. Teresa didn't feel those consolations. But she wanted the God of consolations. Even though she wasn't feeling the consolations. And that's why she's St. Teresa of Avila. And not just Teresa of Avila. Because she perfected her love, even when she felt unloved. Because she was always loved, but she didn't feel it. But feelings don't necessarily count. It's in the will. And St. Teresa was a great saint. She's got 
one of the best lines in the history of the church. She fell down the stairs one day and broke her arm. And she was in real pain. And Christ appeared to her regularly. Okay? And one day Jesus appears to her and she says to him, Well, why did you allow me to fall and suffer this pain? And Jesus said, That's how I treat my friends. And St. Teresa said, Well, that's why you have so few. <laughs> and only St. Teresa could get away with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> If someone asks to be called a certain pronoun, is it wrong to adhere to it? For example, a male asks to be called she or they. Yeah, look, I have a real problem with that. I can't do that. I think it's, in the, it's, it's, it's not living the truth. What is objective? The pronouns should relate to what is objective, not what, I, what, what is subjective. Okay, what do you see in front of you? Or who do you see in front of you? You see a human being. You see a male human being. Every cell of my body speaks to my biological maleness. Now, I could come back next time, I could be dressing as a woman, claiming to be a giraffe. <laughs> I'm a female giraffe. And that's me self-identifying as a female giraffe. And then I insist that you must call me Mrs. Giraffe. <laughs> I'm demanding it. But you know, objectively, you're not female. And you're not a giraffe. So to submit to my demands is to submit to a falsehood, a contradiction. And you should not. Now, there are people... And we've had this policy document come from the Australian the Catholic Bishops' Conference, which relates to schools. There are people, young people, who suffer dysphoria, gender dysphoria. And it's a real psychological condition. And those people deserve love and respect and psychological help. And that's what the document says. The document also says that 80 to 90 percent of these people who are gender confused, young people, desist later on. That is, they actually grow out of it and they are comfortable again in their biological sex. So they might have transitioned to be a female or a male or whatever, but then they revert back to their biological sex. 80 to 90 percent of these transitioners become detransitioners. A lot of this, I have Respect and care for those suffering dysphoria. But I don't respect the opinion of those who are desiring to transition to another sex just because it's a fad. Well, that's what they want to be now. They don't have a psychological disorder. They don't have dysphoria, but they just want to now be male or female and expect the rest of the world to acknowledge that. So I won't do that. Okay. Now, in, I'm okay with schools providing neutral toilets, allowing students to wear it to be in neutral uniforms. Okay. If it's helping those who have dysphoria at, at that time. But I can't, I won't go through the next step of calling a male she because they demand it. Because uh, that's forcing me to contradict, contradict objective reality. On that same note, are we allowed to attend wedding celebrations or ceremonies for friends from other religions, same sex, transgenders, etc.? You can for other religions. Because there, no, there is such a thing as natural marriage. And marriage is a natural thing. Sacramental marriage is a supernatural thing. So if you've got a Hindu friend who's marrying a Hindu woman in a Hindu ceremony and they ask you to the ceremony, you can go. It's a natural law marriage. You know, that doesn't mean you participate in the actual prayers and rites of the Hindu religion, because that's another thing altogether. I wouldn't do that. You're going out of respect for a person as a human being entering a natural marriage. If my one of my children 
If one of my children was entering into a same-sex marriage, I would not attend. I would not. And it's not out of hatred, it's out of love, because I don't think that's God's will for them. It's not a marriage. I know what the world is saying now, okay? Uh, you know, we've got same-sex marriage now as a legal thing, but I don't believe it's God's will for anyone. It's our own will for ourselves. And I would have to respectfully decline, say no, you know, I have, I have rights too, okay? And I have my faith, and your views, you're demanding that your views and your beliefs be respected. Well, I have the same rights to ask that, and I respectfully decline to attend the wedding. You know, you don't abuse or insult or attack them as a person. But I, that, I don't believe it's God's will for any man to marry another man and woman to marry another woman, because that's not sacramental nor natural. Do you have any advice in resisting feelings of resentment towards others who have hurt you? Oh yes, I'm feeling that way all the time. <laughs> uh, and the advice I took on from a Maris priest about 20 years ago is that no matter how you feel inside about that person, say a prayer for that person, even if you have to say that prayer regularly, repeatedly. And it has helped me. You know, it does purify you. It does soften your heart. Okay, I'm talking from experience, and sadly. Yes, next question. How do you separate and connect free will from God's will? Separate and connect. Well, the separation is a problem and the connection is the, is the good thing. Look, we are created as human beings and core to our humanity in our spiritual soul are the spiritual powers of intellect and will. The intellect is that power within us that enables us to know, understand, and judge. To conceptualize things. So an animal might see a red Ferrari and recognize it. And the image of the red Ferrari comes through their eyes into their memory and imagination. And they can recognize again that red Ferrari as belonging to their owner. But the dogs can't then sit down and discuss the concept of Red Ferrari and write about Red Ferrari and improve upon Red Ferrari as a concept. That's what we can do as human beings. So we have an intelligence to know, understand and judge. And now will is the appetite of the intellect. So when I know, understand and judge something, my will determines is the yes or no. And it is free. That's how God made us with a will, and the will is the power to love. So the will is the power to say yes or no to something. And we're judged on, the more you know, the more in danger you are. That's a fact. And so, because God does take into account ignorance and innocent ignorance. Unlike the law, ignorance of the law is no excuse. It is for God. As long as it's not willful ignorance. But we're judged ultimately on how we, like we heard in the homily today in Father's Mass. It's true, it's correct. We're judged on how we love. And that's how we use our will. Now, the most important thing Christ tried to do when he came to the world was reorder our love. Because of original sin, our, we are disordered in our appetites and we are mostly disordered in how we love. So the biggest problem we have is that we love ourselves above God and our love ourselves above neighbour and we hate our enemies. So core in Jesus' teaching is love God with all your mind, body, heart and soul, love your neighbour as yourself, love your enemies. Easier said than done. And that, but love is an action of the will. And of course salvation depends on submitting freely our will to God's will. And and, and that's the road to salvation. Now, the, the classical Protestant reformers, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, Luther and Calvin in particular, together with Islam as well, from its conception, denies free will. Uh, it, it, Luther and Calvin exaggerated the effect of original sin and said original sin bonded our will, we're not free. 
So that reduces God to being an elector who chooses those who are saved and condemned through no say of ourselves. Well, the Catholic Church holds a balanced position and the correct position, and I'm not saying that just because I'm Catholic, which the Catholic Church says that our will was wounded by original sin, and the wound is malice, and malice is that our will engages in excessive self-love. But that, that excessive self-love can be cured by God's grace, who enlightens our intellect and moves our will and enables us to reorder our love so that our love is not implosive, focused on ourselves, but explosive, focused on others. Um, and and that's, the, that's, the, that's our core endeavour, to love rightly. God, God above all things, our neighbours, ourselves and our enemies. You can achieve that, you're going to heaven. Okay? If the vocation of religious life is appealing to you, but you are scared to pursue it, is it prudent to still explore it? And once you have chosen that vocation, um, are you meant to actively pursue it? Well, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. You should explore it, of course. You have to explore all vocations. You do that in prayer, you do that in talking with people, people who are in religious life. You know, getting advice from them, getting advice from prudent, experienced, intelligent, spiritual directors, mostly religious, clerical, or even some lay people. And, you know, look, you know what your vocation is if you feel the warmth for it in the heart. Now, once I found a teacher at a beginning teacher retreat in a separate room by himself, not with the rest of the group. And this teacher was bawling his eyes out. And I knew this teacher. I taught this person at St. Charles. I said, what's wrong? Why are you here by yourself? And he said, look, oh, I've been thinking about the priesthood, but every time I think about it, you know, I, I just, I can't do it. That, that's the struggle of him. That's why he's tortured, he's crying, you know. Uh, I said, and I, well, this was the easiest answer I ever had to give. Well, sorry, but you're not called to the priesthood. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in agony every time you think about the priesthood, then you're not called to it. Go back to the room, and now he's married with kids. <laughs> All right? Okay? Because when God calls you, you know, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. When he calls someone to anything, he's going to call them also to happiness. So, you know, oh, I became a teacher, but I was tortured about it. No, when I was called to be a teacher, I had great joy in my mind and in my heart. I couldn't wait to start. I had to wait five months before, from the time Father George Sutton hired me until I started on the 1st of February, 1990. I couldn't wait to leave Westpac Banking Corporation, <laughs> okay? Legal division, legal services, etc. I had joy. It's so, you know, this is how God works with us freely. He enlightens us, moves us. You know it's your vocation. You should be comfortable and at peace if you're feeling that joy in your mind, in your heart. If you're in agony about, oh, I don't know if I can do this, you're not called to it. Go elsewhere. Find, go on your knees and pray and ask for God to give you... In, the grace, the enlightenment to know what is that road. Whatever that road is, you will have joy in that road. Next question. What's the story of the telescope of the Vatican named Lucifer? No, nah, rubbish. <laughs> These are fantasies. Even if it was called Lucifer, it's, there's a saint called St. Lucifer of Gagliari, one of the great bishops of the 4th century who defied the Arian heresy. Lucifer is not a bad name, it just means light. It's Latin for light bearer. Lucifer was Lucifer's original name. That's the name he was given when he was still a good angel. Okay? There's all these people that go around looking for anything to get the Vatican or to get the Catholic Church on. Lucifer is a normal name. It means light bearer. Don't call your child Lucifer, okay? <laughs> He's going to cop it at school, all right? You know, the poor kid's going to suffer. But we've got Luca, we've got Luke. 
they're shortened version of, versions of Lucifer. Luca, Luke, etc. Okay, All right, Luke from the Greek, Luca, the Italian. Okay, they're not little devils, are they? You know, so uh, if I know there's, if you go on the internet, you find these weirdo videos on YouTube. Oh, the Catholic Church has this prayer that mentions Lucifer. You see, they're really devil worshippers. No, that prayer actually is a real prayer of the church, and it has the word Lucifer there. It just seemed, means light bearer. Lucifer then became Satan, the accuser, the abolos, the divider, devil, the evil one. Now, they're the evil names. Okay? But again, don't call your kid Lucifer. <laughs> How far do we have to take the commandment of keeping the Lord's day holy? Yeah, it's a bit of a struggle. I mean, we don't want to get into the extremism of the Seventh-day Adventists or, or the ancient Jews or even modern-day Jews today or, you know, some Calvinist sectarian groups today. The core thing is that the church regulates under its canon law how to observe the day of rest. And of course, it has been moved from the last to the first day of the week, from the Sabbath, Sunday, Saturday to the Sunday. And that's, there's a reason for that. Because the seventh day in the Old Testament was the sign of the covenant of creation, spoiled by sin. And the recreation is through Christ. And he rises on the first day of the week. So the one sign of the new covenant, okay, what we celebrate is the resurrection every Sunday on the first day of the week. The resurrection happened on the first day of the week. That's why the Christian Sabbath is, and we celebrate and acknowledge that covenant on the first day of the week. Now, the church is now the authority of God in the world, and it's to regulate the observance of this covenant day. And the first thing it says is that following the Ten Commandments, make it holy. And the best way to make it holy is actually to attend the Mass fervently, faithfully, knowing what it is, the Christian sacrifice to God the Father and receiving the Eucharist and praying the prayers. It should also be a day of rest. Should also be a day with family and friends. It should be that day that's different than every other day in the week. Now, there are, you know, people studying, you can do that. People doing repair stuff in the house, they can do. You know, people in hospitals, you know, running our lectures. They're, they're, we have to have essential services. Are they sinning because they work? No, they're not. But if you're a bricklayer working six days a week, you should not be working as a bricklayer on the, on the seventh day of the week. That day has, and now I know there's great <coughs> zones here, and I know you get a bit uptight about this, you know, but fortunately I've always had very busy jobs, but I've never felt the need to work in any of those jobs as, as on the Sunday. Okay, but today when I finish here, I'm going to go home, I'm going to have my siesta, in spite of my Sunday body clock, and then I'm going to prepare a couple of other things, you know, it's, which is not manual work, but intellectual work. Right? But my Sunday is always different to my Saturday, which is different to the Monday to Friday. Yes. How do you convince Protestants that Catholics didn't change the commandments because they seem to think that we removed one of them saying no graven images? Yeah. Well, when you look at catechetical catech catech summaries of the Ten Commandments, that's, they're right, that's not there. Right. But the second commandment in the Protestant rendering is actually part of the first commandment. So the first commandment, when we read in Exodus and we read in Deuteronomy, okay, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. So the original giving is found in Exodus, and what's given in Deuteronomy is 40 years later. So in Exodus, we have a command, I am the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Then it says you have no other idols and statues you that the Pro Protestantism cut that off as a second commandment, isolates it from the first commandment. Basically, the, it's one commandment. Thou shalt have no gods but the one God who led the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. And you are to have no other statues and images of the other gods. So the prohibition of the statues and images was not a prohibition of statues and images per se. 
for the prohibition of statues and images of false gods. And how, how can we be safe about that? Because the Israelites had statues and images. For example, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, they had statues of angels. They're creatures, statues, images, on top of the most sacred box in ancient Israel. And those statues were pointing inwards to the mercy seat where God, as the Shekinah Kabod, the glory presence, was present among the Israelites, fire by day, cloud by night. And also in the temple itself, the Temple of Solomon, the greatest, most important centerpiece of Hebrew and Jewish worship, they had statues of angels as well in the temple. So we have to understand that when you look at a Catholic rendering of the Ten Commandments, we're not getting rid of that second commandment. It's just a summary. And the, we understand that the prohibition against images was against images carved or whatever, anything that was to take us away from the worship of the true God. It wasn't a prohibition against all images per se but really the misuse of images to use them for idolatrous purposes. The, then they say the Catholics, you know, they got rid of commandment two, but they kept it as ten because they separated the, the, the tenth commandment into two. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's wife, thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's goods. Okay, well, you know, the, the church has two distinct, there's two distinct commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not, you know, steal. If you commit adultery, it's a type of stealing. You're stealing someone else's wife. So we have those two commandments separate, so that the, the church sees a logic in saying there's a, it's a set of different types of sins to cover someone's wife as against to cover someone's goods. Right, but essentially, whatever list, we follow the list of St. Augustine, so do the Lutherans, right? But essentially, we have the same commandments you know, because we are, as Catholics, against statues and images that lead us to idolatrous worship. Yeah. At work, I'm often attending events that have an indigenous smoke ceremony. If the person doing it wants to wave the smoke over you, is that taboo slash black magic? Mm, yeah, well, that's a problem too. I mean, I work in a workplace where we have acknowledgements of country welcomes the country. When I first started, some of them were unacceptable. I said to my team, well, I'm not praying this. I'm not invoking the spirits of past ancestors. Sorry, you know. So we changed them. So we have acknowledgements of country now, which are very respectful of the Aborigines, of the indigenous people. Um, and I don't have a problem saying those acknowledgements of country, you know, but I do have a problem with the fact that we have to do it all the time. <laughs> It just it goes on and on and on. It's excessive in how often we do it. Um, but of course, we should always have genuine love and respect for the Aborigine peoples as normal human beings, just like us, our brothers and sisters. I have no issue, never would have any issue with that. Smoking ceremonies worry me, and I wouldn't want anyone to be, you know, coming over my head with something and pouring smoke over me or whatever. I, I would just say, look, please, don't do that. I, I know, I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you very much. My partner isn't into deep theological texts slash study. How do I still nourish myself in the way that appeals to me without siloing them in the process? So what was the first part, first few words? My partner isn't yeah. into deep theological texts slash study. And don't make her. Don't expect her to be. Or him. You know, I presume it's a male asking, but if, if, whoever, that doesn't matter. Don't force your spirituality onto your... I don't like the word partner. It sounds like a business. No, it's not a business. Okay. I, don't, you know, I know it's meant to be inclusive as a term, but your boyfriend, girlfriend, fiancé, husband, wife, keep those traditional terms. But don't make your spouse, fiancé, boyfriend, girlfriend, a clone of yourself. Sure, you've got to have things in common. Fantastic. The more you have in common, the better. Awesome. But, you know, we are still different people. We do have different mentalities and, and psychologies and even spirituality. Be thankful that who you're going out with, hey, believes in God, believes in Jesus, is a practicing Catholic, 
goes to Mass, goes to confession, prays every day, likes the little bit of devotions here and there, you know, uh, says the rosary from time. Be thankful you got someone like that, but don't try and force them. Okay, you can encourage them, you can come to agreement, you know. By the way, my older boys get a lot more mileage with my wife than I do, you know, so my wife easily adopts things that my older children purport to her rather than me. I guess it's again, it's Nazareth syndrome. You can't be a prophet in your own home. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you don't bludgeon or force or compel who, who you're going out with to be praying exactly like you. All right. Um, but you know, be thankful for where they are. And if they are, if you want them to do something that you're doing, well, just propose it in gentleness and love and respect and. If they take it up, great. If they don't, just, you know, be thankful again for where they are at. Okay, we've got three or four questions left, so we're close to the end. Is it healthy <coughs> to get married to a partner when their parents hate you and their father doesn't believe in God? But he believes he's God on earth. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question say? Well, it's not ideal. It's not a not. It's not ideal. But at the same time, it's not a death sentence to the relationship. Of course, the ideal is that you're marrying someone and joining their family. I think one of the one of the great joys I have um, is that I have a great in-laws. Um, my mother-in-law. My, my father-in-law has now passed away, but he was fantastic. And my mother-in-law is excellent. I've only had a couple of arguments with her in 23 years, you know, and so it's fantastic. And my brothers-in-law are great guys. So it is important that when you're marrying, that you know, you, that you, you have you participated in the whole family. It's unfortunate if your future father-in-law hates you and doesn't have the same religion as you. It is worse if both your in-laws don't like you, but that you know, and they are that is going to uh, somehow impact on the family life in the years to come, because you know my children get great joy being with their grandparents both sides and their uncles both sides, especially my in-laws. Okay, and so it's important to have an extended family arrangement. Very important. But it's not fatal to a relationship. If your girlfriend, fiancé, boyfriend, fiancé, if you really do love each other and you have what's called for a successful marriage, then you get married. It's just unfortunate that there's those wounds there on that side, which could, if over time, be improved. You never know. What do you have to say about people to, that pray to the saints before they pray to God? I think it's a bit disordered. You know, our worship is first with God the Father through Christ. Okay? And, you know, that's, that's our, you know, that's the latria, that's our worship. Saints, invoke the saints, fantastic. But, you know, you know the tree is the, if our faith is a Christmas tree, then the tree is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The other things, the devotion to Our Lady, devotion to the saints, they're like the baubles on the Christmas tree. They're good, they add, but you know, you can't have the baubles without the tree. Right? You can't have the intercession of the saints if you're not acknowledging and worshipping God, God the Father. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Did God in the Old Testament allow Jews to kill other nations? Why? It always comes up this question, and it's particularly around the time when Joshua enters Canaan and the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites. It's true, God did order the massacre of those peoples in, the, in Canaan. And we're not comfortable with that. But we're not comfortable with that because we're using Christian principles to judge that. We're judging, we're going back to a scenario about 33 centuries ago. You know, 3,200, 3,300 years ago. It's the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. We don't see Jesus massacring people. You know, the, the, the sons of Zebedee 
ask, you know, said, you know, the Samar this Samaritan village rejected you, Jesus, called down the fire from heaven to consume them. And Jesus rebuked them. Okay? He didn't, he did not agree that the Samaritans should be massacred, you know, by fire from heaven. So what's going on here? It seems like a clear contradiction. The situation in back those 33 centuries ago was that it was impossible for the Israelites to have penetrated into Canaan and survived. They would have been either conquered themselves and destroyed or be assimilated in time and completely abandoned worship of Yahweh and adopt the religion of the, the various pagan tribes in that territory. And God knows that from all eternity. God, with one look, knows all things past, present and future and the infinite array of possibilities. So it was in God's mind, and this is very delicate, very to be very prudent in how he put it, it was a necessity to take this unfortunate pathway because the alternative would have been worse. You see, the whole point of the call of Abraham and the formation of the Israelites, the whole point of that, the whole point of having a chosen people was to enable the incarnation to take place, for God to come into the world. And God was going to come into the world through a woman who had belonged to a particular race, that people had to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. You know, those people would not have survived if they tried to enter Canaan and shake everyone's hands and smile at them and were moving in, let us see them. That wouldn't have occurred. So it was necessitated at that time that the only, that the only way that this people could survive and, and for the sake of the incarnation was that the other peoples had to be eliminated. That's a horrible thing to say, but it was the, the, the and it's a, we wouldn't want to see that happen now, but it was the only realistic option at that time. Um, those people who were massacred, particularly the women and the children, which really causes us a lot of pain and anxiety. Well, God would have judged them lovingly and merciful, mercifully and eternal life would still be possible for them if they, when they were judged, lived according to their conscience and if they were faithful to the law that they knew and the graces they received. Um, for this, this answer that I'm giving is awkward, but and, and, and when atheists hear this answer, they certainly are very hostile to it. But the alternative would have been even worse. The Israelites, men, women and children would have been massacred which would have been a worse outcome in the long term for humanity. Last question for the session. How do you deal with constant fears of family members passing away? We, I'm having that fear quite regularly <laughs> uh, because I'm at a certain age now where I'm seeing people pass away. Uncles, aunties, grandparents, had a friend of mine die just a few days ago. He was only 50 years of age, and he died of a brain tumour. Um, very sad. You can't be morbid about this. You can't be paranoid, always thinking about death. Um, of course, as Christians, we have to prepare for death. And you think about it, like, I'm scared every time my boys are out with their girlfriends, when they're driving around, I'm scared, right? Uh, I just, that's my nature. Maybe I'm excessively scared, but that's who I am. I'm always relieved when they come home safely. And I'm probably going to be even worse when my daughters are older and they're being dating and going out. Um, I think fear is natural, but we can't let it debilitate us. We can't let, us, let it stifle us, right? We just have to have a level of trust, a level of faith and pray. And pray that they're safe and they come home safe. My boys are probably better drivers than me anyway. You know, and the way I drive. Um, that's why I allow myself to drive, to drive and park in disabled parking spots, because the way I drive, people would think I'm disabled. <laughs> you know? uh, and, uh, but that's, again, I think with myself and others, uh, we need to have more faith and trust in God and leave it at that. All right. All right. I think with that, we'll leave our questions and answers there as well. Thank you very much. Well,